So what is the eternity puzzle? It sounds like a philosophical conundrum or a mathematical brain teaser, but it's not. It's an actual physical puzzle that you could buy in the shops a while ago. Um, this is from time ago. So when you open up the box, what you see is 209 green plastic pieces. Uh, that's all of them. This is a selection of them zoomed in. And a board uh, with a dodecagon. And the task is very simple. So fit the pieces together to make this shape. OK, why bother? Well, some people like that kind of thing. <laughs> but as extra motivation for the rest of us, uh, the manufacturer was offering a prize for the first correct solution within a certain time limit, um, and that prize was a million pounds. So that's, that's maybe a reason to bother. OK. Um, when you, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Alex Selby and I uh, worked on this a while ago. Is it related to my research? Sort of yes and no. So the, the way of thinking is similar to the way of thinking, not just in mathematics in general, but in my particular part of mathematics. Uh, we didn't really use any, any theorems or anything, but just a a sort of approach that I'll try to communicate the very basics of in this short talk. Um, so the first thing you might try to work out, given something like this, is very roughly how difficult is it. Okay. And then I think a comparison with the jigsaw is maybe useful. So there are some fiendish jigsaw puzzles with hundreds of pieces, and the picture is like a plate of baked beans, or, or you can get one that's just completely black. But in jigsaw puzzles, there's a convention, so the little wiggly things used to cut them out are all slightly different. Okay. So for each piece, there's exactly one piece that actually fits next to it. So how hard is a jigsaw puzzle? Not that hard. So suppose it has 200 pieces, so you start somewhere. Really, you'd start on a corner or an edge, but in, in large puzzles, that's a fairly minor effect. Um, you would, so you've got one piece. You try all the 208 pieces next to it, which one fits. One of them fits. The others you can immediately discard. OK, so now you've got that one there. Then you try something next to that. There's 207 things to try. One of them will work. You know that's the right one. You continue. So it's a sort of linear process. So how long does it take? The number of steps is something like 208 plus 207 and so on. About half, because probably you won't be so unlucky that you always get the right one last. It'll be halfway through on average. That comes out around 10,000. If you take do about one per second or something by hand, that's a few hours. That's difficult, but you're not going to get a million pounds for that. OK, what about eternity? So the problem is the, the pieces have a sort of geometric shape. So like a jigsaw, the way it's designed is um, the inventor started with the final shape, the dodecagon, and cut it up. So not by hand, but in also using a computer, cut it up into pieces of the right type. So in his solution, there are pieces that are next to each other, and they necessarily fit with each other. Okay? But the pieces are built on a, on a triangular grid. There's only so many angles and side lengths they can have. So all the angles are multiple to 30 degrees, for example. So if you look down the side of a piece, there's only so many possibilities. And with the hundreds of pieces, any given one, there'll be several that fit next to it, not because they belong next to it, just because they happen to fit. So you can't tell. So what does the search tree look like? So you start somewhere, again, maybe in a corner. Maybe there are eight pieces that fit. I've already thrown away the other ones that don't fit. But then for each of those, you can't tell, is this right or not yet? It could be right. And for each of those, you look next to it. You've got 208 pieces. Again, a, a certain fraction of those will fit, and maybe about eight on average. So you'll get that many possibilities. But for each of those, and then in any of these combinations could be right, and it goes on and on like this. Okay, so you get some number like this. The number, individual numbers are not so big, but we're multiplying rather than adding, and that's very, very bad. Okay, so we end up with a number like 10 to the 120, uh, which is about this many steps. Okay, we're not going to do anything by hand, so we didn't touch the pieces until we'd finished. Um, but even on a computer that can do 10 million steps per second, that knocks off seven zeros here. And in a year has 31,536,000 seconds. So, you know, we're not trying to do it in one second, <laughs> but, but it, that comes out of something like 10 to the 105 years, which is not good. But I think this is not an astronomical number. I think it's bigger than astronomical numbers. But <laughs> an astronomer might correct me. Um, yeah, OK. There is something wrong with this. So this is too pessimistic because um, we are trying to find all possible solutions. And maybe there's more than one. Okay. And actually, at the time, we had a good idea this was the case because um, other people were working on the puzzle and discussing their progress on the internet. And some people had, no one said they solved it, but some people said they got quite close. So we didn't believe it could possibly be this hard. OK, how many solutions are there? So this is where a mathematical way of thinking comes in. So given a certain set of the pieces, either they fit together or they don't. Okay? And the puzzle is what it is. There's no randomness in there at all. Um, but we can't find a sort of systematic formula that says this is the rule for when pieces fit together, except just sort of checking whether they do, that would let us count solutions. So we don't know any formula for counting solutions. 
Uh, so what we do is we say, well, the things that we don't know, we model by randomness. Okay, even though it's not, there isn't any randomness there, we just say, let's pretend that where the pieces fit next to each other or not is random. Okay, they do or they don't, but let's forget that. Let's say there's just a certain chance that a pair of pieces will fit together. Okay, so now we can try to calculate and estimate the number of solutions, um, the accidental ones, and so not the ones designed in, and we get a similar thing to before. So we have 209 possibilities for the first piece, 208 for the second, and so on, and each time there's a certain chance, in this case I've approximated by 1 over 27, um, that the piece fits next to what we have before. Okay, very, very good approximation. Comes out with a, a big number of solutions, 10 to 95. That's good, but still not that good, because we're still looking at 10 to the 10 years, which is too long, um, but it's less hopeless. Okay, also, if we redo this, not with exactly 209 pieces, but with n pieces, then the answer comes out as n factorial over a constant to the n. Okay, now as n grows, the bottom multiplies by 27 each time, uh, the thing on the top, when you go from n to n plus 1, it multiplies by n plus 1. So at the beginning, it's increasing slower, uh, but later on, it increases much faster, catches up and overtakes. So what this means is there's a critical size, which is somewhere around 70 or 80, so that if you have a puzzle with eternity-like pieces that's this size or bigger, then this, this expected number of solutions is, is large, so probably the puzzle will have solutions. Okay, what's the implication for this? So here's a schematic curve of how hard it is to solve the puzzle. So the red curve is trying to find all solutions, and the green curve is trying to find one solution. So beyond this critical size, it cannot get harder. So the reason is, as we're putting in pieces at the beginning, this is a little partially filled board, we have lots and lots of choices, that number eight and so on. So we just can't get stuck. Maybe we have to backtrack occasionally a tiny bit, but probably not. So it's very, very easy, given the 209 pieces, to get 139 of them in, like this, and then what's left, actually I don't know how many are in this picture, but what's left is an eternity-like puzzle with 70 pieces, so probably we're not on track to the inventor's solution, probably the very first piece we put down was wrong, but we've got a 70-piece puzzle that probably has accidental solutions. Okay, so we can very easily reduce to a 70-piece, so if we can solve that, we can solve the original. So this hardness curve cannot go up beyond the critical size. And this is something we think the inventor missed. The inventor was Christopher Monckton, uh, Lord Monckton, who's quite an interesting character, um, not a mathematician. And he, but he did try to work out, is this puzzle going to be hard enough for, you know, that the prize won't be won? And he wrote computer programs to solve little puzzles of various sizes. And you know, bigger and bigger, he saw it's getting harder and harder. He saw the beginning of this curve. He knew, yes, other people will write better programs. Other people will run them on lots of computers and so on but I'll just go way beyond the size I can do, I'll, so it's a million, 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 million times harder than my program can do, that'll be okay. okay. That would have been okay if the curve continued going up, but it's the green curve to find a solution that matters, and that stopped going up beyond the point he could see. Um, it's actually worse than that. Sorry, this is coming to that, because not all pieces are the same. So anyone who's played Tetris knows that there are different shapes that fit together better than others. Right? The long, thin one is good, and the S and the Z shape are bad. Right? So, the same is true of eternity pieces, and then that we can use that in our favour. So, the general principle is, at the beginning, in any particular task, with a, with a defined endpoint, but especially here, it's easy at the start. We have lots and lots of choices, so, and at the end it gets difficult. So, at the start, we can try to get the difficult things done. So, we can say which are the good pieces, which are the bad pieces. At the beginning, we have lots and lots of choice, so we'll get bad pieces down, and then we'll be in a picture like this, where we've got a, there are 70 pieces left, and not 70 typical pieces, they're a set of 70 good pieces that are easy to fit together. So now we've shown that the big puzzle, so, so we can convert a 209 piece puzzle to an easier than typical 70 piece puzzle. So as the puzzle gets bigger, it gets easier again. Okay, except we need to know which are the good pieces. So this is a selection of the pieces. So you can see th these ones are pretty good ones, these are somewhere in the middle, these ones are pretty bad ones. So if you were watching on video or we had more time, you could pause and say, try to think out for yourself, what are the factors that make pieces good or bad? Um, so you can guess some factors. So wiggliness is bad. So the bottom ones tend to be pretty wiggly. Being fairly convex is good. Um, other than that, it's not so clear. And, and some things are hard to see in this picture. For example, the first piece is much better than the next four, which are quite a lot better than all the rest. And the last piece is much worse than all the rest. And why is there such a big difference between you know, 58 and 62? Why are they so different from the other 50s? Okay, so you can try to come up with, with factors. 
that you think are important, but that was not the mathematical thing to do. Okay? So you, you see in newspapers about mathematicians invent a formula for something all the time. We knew we could invent a formula, but it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be properly justified. So what we tried to do is not guess, but instead measure. So this doesn't sound like mathematical, but what we wanted to do is gather data, measure how well do the pieces fit together. Not how well do I think, which, what do I think the, the things are that mean certain pieces fit well together, but actually gather data. So in this case, there are some subtleties to how you actually do that, um, but we did it by solving smaller puzzles, basically, and then just seeing um, which pieces, in fact, actual fact, fit together well with the others. Um, and, yeah, so that was part of the outcome. Um, the general principle there, yeah, try not to guess, try to actually gather data, fit it, involves statistical modelling. That was the only actual mathematics in this, maximum likelihood estimation. Um, and did it work? Yes, that's the answer. And there's evidence that we got <laughs> paid. So this is quite a few years ago, so which you can tell from the colour of my hair and also from the jumpers. Um, <laughs> And also, this is not very good evidence we actually paid. If you zoom in, then it's <laughs> <laughs> but, but that, that's what wasn't how it was done. Um, yeah, okay.